Total typical. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this is our next to the last face-to-face -face meeting. We only have one remaining. Uh, it's amazing how quickly the semester has gone by. At least it feels like it's gone by rather quickly. Um, even with all the you know the changes and unique um, things that have been going on. But anyway, let's go over a few announcements, and then we'll get right into the course content. First, I wanted to say that the take-home exam has been added, and your current points and your current grade has, have been updated. And I just did that this morning. So um, if you if you haven't looked at your grade uh, today. When you go and look at it, it will include your take-home exam. I also just finished grading your um, digestive lab quiz as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to um, the uh, practical. I want to also remind you your quiz on the respiratory system is open now, and it will close at midnight. Um, on tomorrow, after your respiratory system quiz has been completed, that's the last lecture quiz of the semester, I will then go in and I will drop your two lowest lecture quizzes and update your grades. So if you had a couple of uh, um, lecture quizzes that were bad, uh, this will help improve your lecture quiz grade and therefore your overall grade substantially. So Michelle had a question about uh, practical three, and I will answer it at this point. It opens tomorrow at 8 a.m. It closes Friday at midnight. So you have about two days to complete it. Please do not wait till the last minute. There are 50 questions. You have 42 minutes, just like last time. There's no backtracking, and the Quizlets will not be available from uh, during the time that the practical is open. The practical covers everything since the last practical. So anatomy of the heart, anatomy of blood vessels, functional anatomy of the digestive system, and the anatomy of the respiratory system. Use those quizlets and use that practice practical to study. Speaking of which, I want to remind you, critical it is that you read the questions. Some students are providing answers because they're just looking at the images and they're not reading the questions. Uh, also, when I use words like specific, then that usually means I want a specific part. For example, one of the answers um, to a question on the digestive system lab quiz was transverse colon. And in the question, I said, name the specific organ. Not that I would ask you for large intestine anyway, because that's just too general and people knew what you'd know that was large intestine before you took this class. I'm not going to ask you something that that um, basic. But in the question, I said specific. So I'm looking for transverse colon, for example. So make sure that you read the questions. Also for cystic duct, many of you answered uh, gallbladder. Not only was I not pointing at the gallbladder, but I specifically referenced the the uh, like a cord-like structure or something like that. Um, and the gallbladder is not really a cord-like structure. Uh, so again, make sure you read the questions carefully because some of you miss points, not because you don't know the answers, but because you're not reading the questions. Also, for arteries and veins, make sure you include an, at least a V for vein and an A for artery. You don't have to spell the whole thing out, but you have to include A for artery and V for vein. Also, make sure for those few blood vessels where you're required to indicate left and right that you do so. All righty. I want to talk a little bit about your final exam. So your final exam is going to open next Wednesday, May 20th at 8 a.m., and it will close Friday, May 22nd at midnight. Now, I may actually open the final exam earlier, so for those of you who want to get it out of the way, but, I, but I, I, I'm not going to commit to doing that at this time. Uh, I will commit that it will be open on Wednesday at 8 a.m. 
if I'm able to get it posted before that, I will I will certainly let you know. And you have until Friday at midnight to complete it. So your final exam has two components to it. The first component covers the new material. So chapter 13, which is the respiratory system, chapter 14, which is the digestive system, and chapter 15, which is the urinary system, which we're currently covering. Like the previous exam, I will split it into two parts so that you don't have to, you know, um, cover, uh, sit down for a whole hour to complete it. Part one and part two, each one will have 25 um, uh, true and false and 25 multiple choice questions. That will cover the new material. There will be a second portion, which is comprehensive. Comprehensive meaning it covers all the previous chapters we've covered. So chapters one through three, chapter four, membranes only, because the rest of that chapter on uh, the integumentary system is being covered on the take-home exam. Five, uh, chapters five to seven, comma, that should be, and nine to 11. And there will be 50 multiple choice questions that cover all of those chapters. Now, if you um, if you go on to Blackboard and you go to l the lecture in course content, you will see final exam. If you click on final exam, you will see the review sheet. The review sheet lists all of the learning objectives for um, the new material, and then it also has the learning objectives for all the other chapters that are going to be covered on the comprehensive section. And what I did, I went in and I removed the learning objectives from all of the, the uh, that that you didn't have to know for the comprehensive section. So, so this is going to be a little shorter than the previous um, list of learning objectives for those chapters. So use that review sheet to um, guide your studying of the comprehensive material. Also, so there are three topics or three major topics that we still have to cover in the urinary system. The formation of urine, the process of voiding or micturition or what you know as peeing, water and electrolyte balance, and acid-base balance. I'm going to start by covering urine formation. We'll certainly cover micturition or the process of urinating. We might start water and electrolyte balance, but I don't think we'll finish it. So I posted on Blackboard in the urinary system, in the folder of homeostasis, the screencast for water and electrolyte balance. And it also contains some self-tests that while graded will not affect your grade in any way. They simply allow you to test your knowledge of the material, the screencast that you just watched to make sure you understood and mastered the learning objectives. So I encourage, as I have with the other screencasts, that you take those, those uh, self-tests so you can understand if you're understanding the material or not, or you can determine if you're understanding the material or not. Okay? And then on Friday, we will cover acid-base balance. So if we don't get through water and electrolyte balance today, that screencast is on Blackboard. Okay? If you, when you click on this folder, you'll see it. Here's the screencast. There are the slides, although you already have the slides. And then here are the self-tests. Okay? All righty. Any questions about any of that information? Then, my friends, we are going to continue talking about the process of urine formation. And I outlined the process on, on Monday. And I, we said that there were three processes involved in urine formation. And this is a schematic of the um, nephron, which is responsible for the production of urine. The first process is filtration, and it occurs at the renal corpuscle. Here you have 
anything small uh, I'm sorry here you have filtered from the glomerular capillaries anything that is small enough to pass through the walls of the glomerular capillaries into the glomerular capsule and that is called filtration after filtration reabsorption occurs we filtered from the blood anything that was basically smaller than uh, a medium-sized protein, and that includes lots of nutrients. Well, we don't want to literally piss those nutrients away, so we want to reabsorb them. And so those substances are going to be reabsorbed from the renal tubule back into the blood, and that's occurring here at B. And the last process is secretion. With secretion, there are still substances in the blood that the body wants to get rid of drugs, toxins, uh, substances that we that the body may have an, an abundance of, and that's going to be moved from the peritubular capillaries into the renal tubule. And after those three processes, filtration, reabsorption, secretion, what remains is a fluid that is mainly water, and it is high in drugs and waste products and substances the body doesn't need, which we call urine. So that's the overview of the process. Now we're going to go and look at each step in detail. So the first process is filtration. And as I mentioned, it occurs here at the renal corpuscle. Here we have the glomerular capillaries, which are fed and drained by arterioles. Here, filtration occurs. Let's look at filtration. So this is the uh, uh, renal corpuscle sort of blown up. You can see this mass of capillaries here. And these capillaries are high pressure. They are both fed and drained by arterioles. Now, this is different from what we've seen in, the, in all previous capillaries. Capillaries are typically fed by an arteriole and they're drained by a vein. And you see this pressure drop across the capillaries. Here, pressure is maintained. Um, by the presence of the smaller efferent arteriole. So we have pressure across the walls of these capillaries, and that allows the movement of anything that's small enough to cross the walls of those capillaries. So basically, um, anything that's smaller than um, a, small pro uh, a small protein will cross. To get a closer look at that, I put together this sort of uh, schematic here, or a little diagram. So we have our afferent arteriole under high pressure, bringing blood into the glomerular capillaries, and it's being drained by a smaller efferent arteriole. So we have sort of specialized, unique anatomy, and that's going to reflect specialized, unique. Um, uh, uh, physiology or function. And so with pressure being maintained across the walls of the capillaries, substances small enough to pass through are going to be filtered. And so basically what is filtered from the blood of the glomerular capillaries are basically anything, sm anything smaller than a small protein. So water, glucose, amino acids, calcium, potassium, you know, all your electrolytes, et cetera, will be filtered. What's not filtered? Well, blood cells aren't filtered. They're too big. Uh, white blood cells, red blood cells, plasma proteins, they're not small enough to pass out of those capillaries. So what is filtered, which we call the filtrate, is basically plasma minus the plasma protein. So that filtrate is basically the plasma portion of blood minus the plasma protein. And that filtrate moves from the glomerular cap capsule into the first portion of the renal tubule, which is the proximal convoluted tubule, abbreviated PCT. Okay, so our first process is now complete. We have filtered the blood, and now we have a filtrate 
that basically is the plasma portion of blood minus the plasma proteins. But we don't want to lose the plasma portion of blood minus the plasma proteins. We want to, the digestive system has spent a great deal of spent a great deal of energy and time digesting and absorbing substances in this filtrate like amino acids and glucose and calcium and phosphorus and vitamins and many electrolytes. So we don't want to lose that through urine. So we're so the kidney is going to reabsorb those substances. And please call it reabsorption. Don't call it absorption. Call it reabsorption because it's we are we are absorbing what was filtered. So we are reabsorbing that. And that is going to occur in the renal tubule. Substances are going to move from the renal tubule into the paratubular capillary. So let's look at that in detail. So let's focus on those paratubular capillaries. They start here at the end of the efferent arterial, and they end there. Notice that they basically are strung all around the renal tubule because they're responsible for reabsorption of substances from the renal tubule into the paratubular capillaries, back into the blood. And in a moment, we're going to talk about uh, uh, secretion, which is movement from the paratubular capillaries into this renal tubule. Essentially, it's reabsorption in reverse. All right. So substances are going to be reabsorbed all along that renal tubule from the renal tubule into the blood of the paratubular capillaries. And these capillaries are your normal capillaries fed by a uh, arteriole where, where I have the start arrow and drained by a venule where I have the end arrow. All right, so what's going to be reabsorbed? Well, we don't want the body to dehydrate. So we're going to absorb most of the water that was filtered. Any glucose that was filtered is typically reabsorbed. Glucose is an energy source, so we don't want to lose that. Amino acids are used to build proteins, uh, so we don't want to lose that. So that's going to be reabsorbed. And many ions, depending on the relative levels in our blood, are going to be reabsorbed. So calcium, sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, selenium, and the list goes on and on. Many of those ions are going to be reabsorbed as well. Now, what's not going to be reabsorbed? Well, substances that the body doesn't need, that, 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 that has no useful function in the body. Well, we're not going to reabsorb those. So waste products, such as urea, which is a which is a uh, waste product of amino acid metabolism. That's not going to be reabsorbed. Uric acid from nucleic acids, that's another waste product. It's not going to be reabsorbed. Creatinine, which is a waste product formed from the metabolism of creatine phosphate in our muscles, if you remember their function, donating ATP to ADP, right? That's a waste product. None of those waste products are going to be reabsorbed. We're only reabsorbing substances that are useful in the body, okay? All right, so that's reabsorption, moving from the renal tubule back into the blood of the paratubular capillaries. Now, Everything is not filtered from the blood that we don't need. There's still substances still in the blood that have no useful function that the body is going to try to continue to get rid of. And so in addition to reabsorption, there is secretion that occurs at the same time. And secretion is basically reabsorption in reverse. Substances are transported from the paratubular capillaries into the renal tubule. So let's look at what type of substances are secreted. Drugs, like the break, the, the um, products resulting from the metabolism of that aspirin that you, or ibuprofen that you may have taken this morning because you had a headache. Or if you're on um, a prescription drug, the body breaks those down. The kidneys, sorry, uh, the liver specifically breaks those down. And then those products are are secreted from the blood into the renal tubules. Some poisons, believe it or not, there's small amounts of poisons that we're ingesting and breathing in all the time. 
they're hopefully at very small amounts in the water that we drink, in the air that we breathe, in the food that we eat. Uh, and one of the reasons why they don't cause us, pro cause us problems at very levels is because our kidneys are constantly removing those from our blood. And if we have an excess of certain ions, like hydrogen ions or potassium ions or other ions, if we have more than we need, the, those are going to be secreted into the renal tubules as well. Now, let's look a little more closely at how this occurs. So what we're going to do here, we're going to take that, we've taken that renal tubule and we've sort of stretched it out here, all right? So that's what we're looking at here. Now, what's missing? I uh, sort of, sort of um, showed you what's missing. But what's missing here is I'm not showing you all of the paratubular capillaries that are wrapped around this renal tubule because it would look like this and it would be just horrible. Uh, and so what I want you to remember is outside of, all, all out here, outside of these renal tubules is the blood, okay? Well, I'm not, because it makes for a very ugly, um, for a very ugly figure, I'm not showing the blood, but the blood is out here outside of this renal tubule. So any arrow that, like this one here that points away from the renal tubule is reabsorption because substances are moving from the renal tubule back into the blood of the paratubular capillary. Any arrow that's pointing toward the renal tubule is secretion. Okay, is everyone understanding that? Any arrow pointing away from the renal tubule is reabsorption because the blood is out here. And then any arrow pointing toward the renal tubule indicates secretion. Okay, so let's look at these three different components of the renal tubule and, uh, and in detail what's happening there. All right, so this is the renal corpuscle here. So we've had filtration here, and we've had this filtrate that passes into the proximal convoluted tubule. In the proximal convoluted tubule, this is where most reabsorption is going to occur, and it is what is called obligatory. It basically means it, it occurs at a constant rate. It doesn't really matter the levels in your blood. Okay, so here most of the glucose is reabsorbed, most amino acids are reabsorbed, most of your water is reabsorbed, as well as other ions, and it occurs at a constant rate, right? Typically, 100% of glucose is reabsorbed. doesn't matter what the levels are in your blood. They can be very low, they can be very high. Well, well but within the normal range, shall I say, all right? This is a constant rate. Also, we have secretion. Most of the poisons that are going to be secreted into the renal tubule occur here, as well as the secretion of ions that we have, we may have an overabundance of, like potassium or hydrogen ions. All right, that filtrate then moves to the loop of Henle, although we prefer to call it the renal loop these days. We're trying to get away from naming things after, after people, but it's still referred to as the loop of Henle. In the loop of Henle, you mostly have just reabsorption, reabsorption of water and salt, sodium chloride. So that's basically what's happening here in the loop of Henle. And when we get to the distal tubule, the distal convoluted tubule, here is where reabsorption and, to a certain extent, secretion is determined by the body's current state and it's influenced by the presence of hormones now what do i mean by it's influenced by the presence of hormones and it depends on the body's state well if you have a say for example a large amount of sodium chloride um, in your blood and it's being <clears throat> uh, if you have a large amount of sodium chloride in your blood here, there's going to be less sodium chloride reabsorbed because the levels are high. On the flip side, if you, let's say you have low, uh, high levels of potassium in your blood, well, testosterone 
is secreted in response to high levels of potassium. And what does it do? It causes re, um, re increased reabsorption of sodium chloride. So here is where aldosterone would have its effect. If you have a large amount of poisons and drugs in your uh, body for whatever reason, there'd be increased reabsorption here. Also, there there'd be, I'm sorry, increased secretion here. Also, there'd be increased secretion of hydrogen ions. So in your distal convoluted tubule, absorption and secretion is less than what occur, occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, and it's influenced by the current state of the body. After that, the filtrate moves to the collecting ducts. Now, at this point, it's technically out of the nephron. And as it moves to the collecting duct, and, the collect, and one collecting duct is fed by several nephrons, right? Like here you'd have a nephron, here you'd have a nephron, here'd be another one, etc. All along the collecting duct, you have reabsorption of water and salt. And antidiuretic hormone will increase the reabsorption of water. And aldosterone will increase the reabsorption of sodium chloride and water. And so as the filtrate moves through the collecting duct, it's being, con <clears throat> excuse me, it is being concentrated. We've got reabsorption of water, reabsorption of sodium chloride, such that what leaves the collecting duct is high in nitrogenous waste products drugs, poisons, substances that the body has an overabundance of, and that is what we call urine. So the substance that we call urine produced by the kidneys results from these three processes, filtration of pretty much everything in the, in the plasma minus the plasma proteins, reabsorption of all the substances that we need, secretion of substances that we don't need, <clears throat> and then what's left is high in substances that we don't need, poisons and drugs, which we call urine. So those are the three processes, filtration and reabsorption, and then secretion. So now that you understand the process that urine is formed, let's talk about normal characteristics of urine and and let's start by talking about well, what we should normally find in urine so it is common to find many different ions in urine ions are small enough to be filtered and depending on their levels in the body uh, they may or may not be reabsorbed in full so it's common to find all of these ions in urine Waste products, we definitely expect to find in urine because they're filtered, they are um, secreted, and they're not reabsorbed. So urea, uric acid, creatinine, and ammonia, we should find, although we shouldn't find very large amounts of ammonia. And then breakdown products from drugs and toxins that we may have ingested, we should find in urine as well. Urine also should be pretty much close to sterile. Why? Well, because it's filtered from your blood, and your blood should pretty much be sterile. Now, I have had some students inform me that, you know, they would take a microbiology class, and they tell me, hey, you know, actually, urine is not sterile. Uh, there are normal, quote unquote, normal bacteria that you should find in your urinary tract, and therefore you would find it in. Uh, in the urine, right? So there may be some exceptions there, but um, it, could you drink urine um, and not be afraid of becoming ill? The answer is yes, you could, because it's filtered from your blood, and therefore it is it is sterile under normal circumstances. It should have a slight aroma to it. It should not, under most circumstances, have a have a strong odor. But you would expect it to be slightly uh, have a slight odor to it. And if you're and if you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, I've gone into a bathroom and I can smell 
you know, very foul smelling urine. Well, if someone didn't flush the toilet and they let the urine just sort of sit there for hours, bacteria start metabolizing substances in it that are aromatic, and then it will take on a very foul smell. Um, but fresh urine should only be slightly aromatic. Urine typically has a yellow color to it, and that is due to the breakdown product of um, hemoglobin, which is urochrome, also called urobilin, and it, it has a yellow color to it. Okay? Um, you probably notice that your urine will change colors depending on how well hydrated you are. Now, this is a sort of a little chart that I found um, that showed the different um, colors of urine from very light to very dark. Now, I don't know how accurate these descriptions are in terms of when you're dehydrated and when you're, you know, when you're at risk of dehydration and that sort of thing. So I don't want to focus on that, but I do want to drive home the message that your urine can vary quite a bit in, uh, in color. The more hydrated you are, the less concentrated the urine and the lighter in color it is. If you drink a lot of water, you probably notice that your urine tends to be very bright. Uh, I'm sorry, very clear. If on the other hand, you haven't been drinking a lot of water, your urine will tend to be darker in color. And of course, some foods can alter the color of urine as well. When a urinalysis is done, a part of that urinalysis will include a specific gravity. Specific gravity basically sort of measures the density of a liquid. Distilled water, which is 100% H2O, has a specific gravity of 1. So the closer your urine is to 1, the more hydrated you are and the less concentrated it is. The farther you move from 1 towards, say, 1.035, the more concentrated it is. So when you first get up in the morning after you've slept all night and you haven't been hydrated, you would expect your, your urine to be darker in color and to have a higher specific gravity versus if you're drinking a lot of water and your urine is clear, you expect it to be closer to 1. Got a little ahead of my slides there. Typically, the pH of urine is around 6. However, it can vary quite a bit because the food that you, can, that you consume and other health um, conditions can alter your urine pH. If you are a meat eater, you will tend to have a lower pH, uh, urine pH. If you are vegetarian or vegan, and depending on how strict you are, you will tend to have a more alkaline pH. So we've talked about substances, the normal characteristics of urine and the substances we should normally find in urine. Let's talk now about substances that are not normally found in urine and they could indicate a disease state or an abnormality. First, glucose should always be 100% reabsorbed. If we find glucose in the urine, what it typically means is that the individual has hyperglycemia, probably diabetes, where they have a level of glucose in their blood. So the filtrate has a high level of glucose in it. And the um, renal tubules are simply not able, or the peritubular cavities are simply not able to reabsorb all of that glucose. It's too much. And so there is glucose that remains in the urine. And typically what you, what you also have is uh, if you have someone who has glucose in their urine, they will tend to urinate a lot because that glucose it has a charge to it and it holds water in the renal tubules and less water is reabsorbed. Blood proteins and large proteins should also not be found in the urine. Think for a second. Why should you not find blood proteins and other large proteins in the urine? Under normal circumstances, they're too large to even be filtered. So they should never have made it from the blood into the renal tubules. So if you find blood proteins and other large proteins 
in the urine that typically means there's kidney damage. Likewise, you shouldn't have red blood cells or white blood cells in urine because, again, they can't be filtered. So white blood cells would indicate um, infection, and red blood cells would indicate there's hemorrhage into uh, loss of red uh, loss of blood into the renal tubule somewhere along uh, the nephron. Hemoglobin sh should also not be in the urine for obvious reasons. Hemoglobin is only found in red blood cells; shouldn't be in the urine. It's too large to be uh, filtered. Bile should also not be in the urine. It shouldn't be in the blood. Therefore, it shouldn't uh, uh, and therefore it shouldn't be filtered. If it is in the blood and is filtered, that, that typically means there's some kid there's some uh, either damage to the gallbladder or there is damage to uh, the liver. Okay. The presence of any of these substances in urine could indicate a disease or damage to the kidneys. Uh, and this is a figure from your book. And no, I am not going to um, hold you to knowing the possible causes or conditions uh, where you will see these substances in the urine. However, I do want you to know that these substances, glucose, protein, white blood cells, red blood cells, hemoglobin, bile should not, under normal circumstances, be found in the blood. And why? Either they're not filtered or they should be reabsorbed completely. That I do want you to know. The, the possible disease conditions that would be indicated by these substances in the, in the uh, urine, I'm not going to hold you to know that. Okay, before we move on to talk about the process, uh, what happens to urine after it leaves the kidneys, are there any questions, any clarifications that I need to make on um, the process of urine production? Please um, raise your hand so I can recognize you, or uh, you may, of course, um, just text in your questions. Okay, no questions at all. Okay, so let's move on to our next topic. So we're going to now talk about, well, what happens to urine after it leaves the kidneys? We're going to explain the function of the urinary bladder, which is responsible for holding the uh, urine, and then we're going to describe micturition and a micturition reflex. Micturition is simply voiding or what you know as urination or peeing. We're going to describe incontinence and its possible causes retention and its possible causes as well. Okay, so this is a frontal uh, section of the kidney. Here in the uh, renal cortex is where we find most of the um, nephrons, and those nephrons produce the urine. That urine then moves here to the renal medulla, and then eventually into what are called what are called um, calyces. They basically, that's what collects the urine, and then that urine moves into the renal pelvis and then into the ureter. And the ureter is this like thin muscular tube that's then going to move that urine from the kidneys down to the urinary bladder. So the urinary bladder is found in your pelvis. You can see here how the ureters enter the urinary bladder behind the peritoneum, what's called retroperitoneal. Urine is moved down to your, the ureters by gravity and some peristalsis. The kidneys are constantly making urine, right? They make it all day, all night, when you're asleep, when you're awake. The purpose of the urinary bladder 
is to store that urine till it's the appropriate time to void or urinate. The urinary bladder itself is this muscular tube found in the pelvis. You can see here where the ureters enter the bladder. There are these two little orifices called ureteral orifices through which urine enters the urinary bladder. As I said, kidneys form urine continuously. Over a 24-hour period, they filter some 150 to 180 liters of plasma through the glomerulus, most of which is reabsorbed, but that's a small amount that is not reabsorbed plus the amount that is secreted is stored in the urinary bladder until it's the appropriate time for its removal. So the urinary bladder just simply stores the urine that the kidneys are constantly producing. So in other words, the urinary bladder allows you to wear pants or to wear a dress. If we didn't have the urinary bladder, we would just simply leak urine all day long and all night long, which would be an absolute mess, right? What, the, what our urinary bladder allows us to do is to store the urine until it's an appropriate time to go to the bathroom and relieve ourselves. Let's look a little more closely at the urinary bladder, if I can get this to work. Okay. So as I said, it's a muscular sac. Um, it's, it can expand and it can, uh, as it's being filled, and it can collapse as it's being emptied through voiding. The uh, most of the wall of the urinary bladder is made up of smooth muscles, specifically called detrusor muscles. There's actually three layers of these muscles. And do you remember the transitional epithelium that you were introduced to in chapter three? Right. Um, this transitional epithelium looks like stratified epithelium. Um, when the urinary bladder is empty and then as the urinary bladder fills and stretches, then it takes on more of a simple uh, epithelial look to it. But anyway, the transitional epithelium lines the uh, um, inside of the urinary bladder. The mucosa is composed of the transitional epithelium. The urinary bladder, as I said, can stretch and collapse when it's empty. It's about two inches long. And when it's filled, it can, it can hold a little over a pint of urine. It can stretch as far as uh, five inches. So it has a, a significant ability to um, expand. Now, let's talk about micturition or voiding. And, of course, this has many different names to it. Draining the lizard. Going to see a man about a horse. Or my favorite, knocking the dew off your lilies. Uh, but regardless of what you call it, we are talking about basically emptying the bladder of urine. This is called micturition or voiding. Let's look at how that occurs. And of course, all of us are familiar with this process. Uh, so let's talk about how it actually occurs. Well, I should say we're, we're experienced in this process. So what's going to happen during micturition is urine is going to leave the bladder through the urethra, right? This is the urethra, it's this, this, this tube that basically connects the bladder to the outside world. The opening to the outside world is the urethra. Urine is going to pass through the urethra there are two openings that are controlled by muscles. The inner opening, is, which is called the internal urethral orifice, that opening is controlled by smooth muscle. Smooth muscle, which is not under voluntary control, controls the movement of urine from the bladder into the urethra through the internal urethral sphincter. There is also another sphincter muscle called the external urethral sphincter. The external urethral sphincter 
controls the movement of urine out of the the urethral um, tube here, uh, the urethra, through the external urethral orifice and out to the outside world. So basically, the internal urethral orifice, uh, the internal urethral orifice is controlled by smooth muscle, but controls what enters the urethra. The external urethral sphincter controls what exits the urethra. The external urethral sphincter is under voluntary control. It's skeletal muscle. So what this means is that the process of urination has a involuntary component to it because the internal urethral sphincter is controlled is composed of smooth muscle and the external urethral sphincter is composed of skeletal muscle. So you can't control what enters the urethra but you can control what leaves the urethra. When <clears throat> both of these orifices are open, you have micturition or voiding. Okay, so urine is going to pass from the bladder completely through the urethra and out to the outside world during micturition. So let's look at how this occurs. And uh, have a bit of a, a Looks like a duplicate slide here, so I apologize for that. All righty. So, so let's say, okay, so you have a bladder, and that bladder is being filled with urine, right? So as that bladder fills and expands, there are stretch receptors in the walls of the bladder that detect stretch as that bladder fills. And they're going to send impulses to the sacral spinal cord. That is where we have the integrating center for the micturition reflex. So it receives sensory input, basically telling us that the bladder is being stretched. The bladder is being stretched. When there's about 200 milliliters in the bladder, the sensory input to the sacral spinal cord is going to cause motor impulses to move back to the bladder and cause the detrusor muscles to begin to contract. When that occurs, that's going to cause stretching of the walls of the bladder even more, and it causes relaxation of the internal urethral sphincter, and urine moves through the internal urethral orifice into the urethra. At the same time, impulses are going to be sent to your medulla oblongata. And as that urine moves into the urethra and those neural impulses are sent to your medulla oblongata, you are going to get the sensation or urge to go. That's what happens when you go, ooh, I got to find a bathroom, right? That's what has happened. A little urine has entered the urethra and you've had impulses sent to your medulla oblongata. If it is um, an appropriate time to go, let's say you're near a bathroom, then you simply you simply relax the external urethral sphincter and urine passes through the urethra and out into the toilet or the tree or wherever you are. However, well, let's say you're sitting in a movie theater or you're in class and it's not appropriate to go, right? You fail to relax the external urethral sphincter. Eventually, the detrusor muscles become fatigued and they stop contracting. And that urge to go or void goes away. However, after so many more minutes of the bladder filling again, that micturition reflex will be initiated again. And that's why you get like that urge to go. And if you suppress it, oh, it goes away. But you know it's going to come back as the bladder continues to be filled. Okay, let's talk about a couple of dysfunctions in micturition. Incontinence is the inability to control the external urethral sphincter. 
Children typically less than two years of age do not have total control of the external urethral sphincter. That's why sometimes um, you're told, hey, don't worry about potty training a child when they're less than two years of age. With pregnancy, you have uh, the fetus pushing down on the bladder, and sometimes that, in the, uh, that, uh, that results in a loss of control of that external urethral sphincter. So you'll see incontinence during pregnancy. If there's a spinal, spinal cord energy, uh, injury, stroke, that can result in incontinence. Uh, and in, in prostatectomy, the removal of the prostate, almost always you have at least some temporary loss of um, control of that external urethral sphincter. Urinary retention is the opposite. With urinary retention, you, um, you have the inability to void, um, to allow urine to pass out of the bladder through the, through the urethra and then, and then to the outside world. That can result from uh, anesthesia, uh, which is typically why you're catheterized during a, uh, during a procedure and they want you to urinate before you leave the hospital. Um, also in men, as we age, sometimes uh, it, it's common to get an enlarged prostate and the first section of the urethra passes through the prostate and enlargement of that prostate can collapse that urethra. And so you get the inability to void. So this is normal. This would be um, enlarged prostate resulting in urinary retention. With urinary retention, the last thing we want to happen is for the bladder to rupture. And so typically a catheter will be inserted. And this is always a fun uh, procedure to talk about. A catheter is threaded through the urethra into the bladder. A little balloon is blown up to keep it in place and that can allow for the draining of the bladder. I'm sure that is a, a, a most enjoyable procedure. There's the catheter and the, uh, <clears throat> and the balloon. Okay, we are at the end of our time, uh, and so I'm not going to be able to go over water and electrolyte balance. However, as I mentioned, water and electrolyte balance, that screencast is on Blackboard. On Friday, we will cover acid-base balance. I'll, I'll open up the floor for questions about water and electrolyte balance, and then we'll move right into um, we'll move right into uh, acid-base balance. So thank you for your time. For those, uh, if you have any questions, I'll open the floor up for this at this at this time. Be back.